Hello again, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. First full day of summer, actually, uh, summer solstice occurred yesterday at around 5 in the afternoon. And so actually, that's when summer began, but the 21st here being the first full day of summer. And expect the days to start getting shorter here, but not noticeably for some time. And looking at uh, rainfall, uh, good soaking rains up into the, as you can see, Tanana Valley with Fairbanks. These are 24-hour amounting at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Seeing over an inch of precipitation, Delta Junction off to the east, uh, same thing, just a shade over an inch. And a uh, couple areas up there seeing even more than that in uh, other, uh, more, it was a more mountainous location. Off to the southwest, even the Nana picking about eight-tenths of an inch of precipitation and a swath of uh, soaking rains covering quite an area down in the Cuscombe Valley there, McGrath picking up six tenths, and uh, even Caltech this afternoon due to thunderstorms picked up uh, almost six tenths of an inch of precipitation as well. And moving on to the fire danger map, uh, of course, uh, not non-existent there in the uh, Tanana Valley down in the Cuscombe Valley all the way out to the southwest coast. Kind of an elevated area there north of uh, north northwest of Iliamna Lake and west of the Alaska Range. Kind of in a small dry area there and a little bit of a return to some high to very high fire danger there along the uh, Porcupine and Upper Yukon, or Yukon River in that area. But uh, a little bit of an improvement, really not much change, uh, some change improvement over the Seward Peninsula, definitely over the Yukon Delta. That area is more widespread yesterday and is pulled back toward the coastline now. And just one zone there of uh, extreme fire danger showing up. Uh, looks like uh, north of Kotzebue in toward the, ta or the uh, Noatak Valley areas. Also some improvement there on the north slope as well as even over the Kobuk Valley areas. And moving on to the hazardous weather graphic. No watches, warnings, or advisories out anywhere in the state for the next uh, probably couple of days. Distinct lack of any kind of active storms that would uh, generate those. Kind of a summer pattern here. You can see clouds moving uh, from Canada westward into uh, across and southwest of Alaska. They're bringing that uh, good shot of moisture in to the uh, Tanana Valley and even all the way down into the North Gulf Coast, but those amounts were much lighter in the Copper River Basin. They weren't as heavy as, uh, say, around the Fairbanks and Delta Junction area, but uh, good rainfall all the way out to the uh, Yukon Delta, and to a lesser extent over the Cuscoam Delta, and up to the north you can see what appears to be the darker area, our clear sky, Seward Peninsula, and up across uh, Northwest Interior, and looks like the North Slope and the uh, Brooks Range looking pretty good, then more clouds in westerly flow as an upper level low over the Arctic drops uh, southward. But uh, in between the clouds along the Yukon and Cuscombe River valleys there and the system I just spoke of have a break at higher pressure resulting in temperatures approaching 80 degrees in some areas over the northwest interior and 70s, otherwise uh, much cooler, of course, under the cloud cover and showers in the uh, central and southern interior areas. A cloudy, showery, rainy day for the Panhandle with uh, generally dry, not much in the way of precipitation falling over the southern areas this afternoon, but still a lot of clouds. You can see a frontal boundary there approaching the far western Aleutians slowly, mostly the uh, Cirrus Shield uh, coming in over the Shimianatu area there, and some more moisture over the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, uh, something of a break, but still a lot of clouds around with that system to your southwest, uh, really not affecting the area too much. And on the chart today, uh, there's that uh, low pressure area south of the Alaska Peninsula, maybe a few showers up along the trough into the uh, Pribilof Islands, and areas of light rain in advance of that front there, uh, not as active or widespread as what this uh, what, what the chart implies, but. Uh, up over the interior, afternoon thunderstorms developing again, as I mentioned, Caltech uh, picking up about six tenths or half an inch of precipitation 
a third of, over a third of an inch fell in an hour in that location. So some of those thunderstorms pr producing some pretty good uh, downpours. And uh, again, a widespread area of precipitation and clouds and moisture, cool temperatures, even over the southeast coast today with the sunshine up uh, from the northwest coast there in across the Brooks Range and into the North Slope. Again, some area w some areas pushing up toward 80 degrees this afternoon in the northwest there toward the Noatak Valley and uh, Kobuk Valley areas, mostly in the 70s though, and much cooler down to the south and of course much cooler up to the Arctic coast there. See that uh, first surge of moisture with the upper level low up over the Arctic there off the map, that first surge is grazing the central Arctic coast, but tonight an actual Arctic front will drop southward and southeastward and bring a chance of rain to the central and western Arctic coast tonight. Uh, especially toward morning, it'll remain dry over the northern interior and that trough will keep uh, showers and areas of rain, especially over toward the eastern interior going tonight, but the amount should be less and not as uh, heavy as they were in the last 12-hour uh, period, 24-hour period. Partial clearing over Bristol Bay that'll extend out into the southeast Bering Sea and the offshore areas of Bristol Bay there. Weak trough, low clouds, fog, drizzle, uh, pretty likely for the Aleutians and uh, all the way out to the west, high pressure, no winds over the Bering Sea, so expect a lot of low clouds, fog, and IFR conditions out there. And leftover moisture keeps periods of rain possible there for the Barren Islands up along the uh, North Gulf Coast, into Prince William Sound, shower activity into the Talkeetnas, diminishing showers over the northern Panhandle, increasing rain over the southern southeast coast is at front and weak low. Uh, spread some moisture back into that area and that will be slow moving so look for a wet rainy day over the central and southern southeast coast and a chance of rain or showers up to the north but uh, not much way not in the not much in the way of any sunshine expected there could see a few breaks south central alaska generally dry day coming up maybe some isolated showers along the alaska range or the mountainous terrain of the copper river basin otherwise not a bad day across the south dry kodiak island dry for the alaska peninsula no change over the bering sea and the aleutians that arctic front uh, pushing south of the bering strait by tomorrow afternoon and for tuesday that continues to southward push and a 1004 millibar low develops along the frontal boundary just west of Makoriak. So look for periods of rain to approach the Perbolofs in the afternoon, extend up that frontal boundary into the Yukon Delta coast, all the way up into Norton Sound, another band of moisture there into the, uh, that's going to bring some precipitation now back into the Brooks Range and portions of the North Slope and from the Noatak Valley and Kotzebue area eastward all the way across the upper Yukon Valley into Canada. Isolated thunderstorms possible over the Copper River Basin and uh, wet over the northern panhandle. Lows tonight, uh, lower 50s there from the Yukon Valley, right on down the River Valley to uh, actually Bethel and the southern Seward Peninsula, but highs tomorrow, upper 30s, north side of the Seward Peninsula, lower 60s there toward Nome, and generally maybe 70, and that's about it over the upper Yukon Valley. Otherwise, uh, kind of on the cool side, lower 60s, southern Alaska, Lows the following morning, near or shade below freezing all of the Arctic coast, part of the North Slope as well, and Shishmaref looking for a low of 31 and 40s elsewhere over the state, and for the highs, 60s in the interior, 30s on the Arctic coast, and lower 60s, southern Alaska. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Flying weather for Monday morning, the first graphic here showing IFR along the Arctic coast and VFR from the southern north slope uh, across the Brooks Range into the upper Yukon, Kobuk, Selawik Valleys, Kotzebue Sound, northwest coast, Notak Valley over to the upper Yukon area and then kind of a real narrow area of uh, VFR uh, coming southwestward to Bristol Bay and the Cuscombe Delta. IFR, most of the Aleutians, central western Bering Sea. So for the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island uh, and across Seward Peninsula VFR. Marshall VFR there across the eastern interior, Copper River Basin, Upper Tanana Valley, all of the Alaska Range and Cook Inlet kind of uh, in the VFR zone. Southeast coast IFR spreading up across Prince of Wales Island eastward to uh, Metlakatla, Ketchikan and uh, those areas. That'll become just uh, Marginal VFR across much of the area there for Monday afternoon, actually all the southeast coast, and uh, pretty marginal there for the uh, southeast interior with uh, IFR from St. Matthew Island southward across a good portion of the Bering Sea covering 
nearly all the Aleutians, except for on Alaska Island, you will be marginal. And a portion of the Alaska Peninsula will be VFR, and a zone of VFR will extend up across Bristol Bay into Togiak, Dillingham, Cusquam Valley looking pretty good on up into the uh, Kobuk Valley, and then along and north of the Yukon River to the Eastern Brooks Range. And for Tuesday morning, IFR, Eastern Arctic Coast, Eastern North Slope, and Central and Eastern Brooks Range, VFR, Central Interior, Southwestward, Yukon Cusquam Delta, into Bristol Bay, IFR, Nunavak Island, covering the Aleutians, and marginal VFR for the uh, Southeast Coast, and just about all the Eastern Interior areas. For the afternoon, Tuesday, we've got uh, some IFR hanging on to the eastern Arctic coast across the North Slope, on down to the central and eastern Brooks Range, uh, mostly on the northern side there with marginal VFR southwest across the Kobuk Valley into Norton Sound where it becomes IFR and pretty expansive IFR out over the Bering Sea covering all of the Aleutians. Marginal VFR along and north of the Alaska Peninsula, VFR south side. And Southern Alaska, uh, pretty much in the VFR area, right on up into the eastern interior there. But IFR up into Prince William Sound, North Gulf Coast, Southern Kenai Peninsula. And marginal VFR uh, into the Wrangell Mountains and continuing over the Panhandle, including Kodiak Island, Southern Cook Inlet. Four passes, Anatuvik VFR trending toward marginal, well, actually becoming marginal, possibly by midday. and just a, even a risk of some IFR in the northern approach with that system coming down from the north. Same pattern for Attigan, deteriorating conditions throughout the day. Lake Clark and Merrill, uh, the opposite, starting out marginal, becoming VFR. Same trend for Rainy, marginal VFR to start and VFR through late morning in the afternoon. Windy, though, will stay marginal at times throughout the day. Occasionally marginal for Isabel and mostly marginal for Mentasta. Looks marginal for Tanita. And Portage, marginal. Chilkoot and White, looks marginal. And for the freezing levels, uh, big area, 6,000 feet. There's southern Alaska Panhandle Gulf, Alaska Peninsula Kodiak, and then warmer air aloft, uh, not that much warmer, but around 8,000 feet. And then the cooler air there uh, starting to push south where you can see uh, kind of a gradient on the Arctic coast, 6, 000, 6 to 8,000 feet lines, pretty close together. Icing, mixed icing, freezing level 17,000 feet there. Could be some considerable moderate, possibly, uh, upper Tana Valley area, but uh, otherwise more scattered around. Uh, to a couple of zones of rime icing. Uh, doesn't look too significant at this point. Heaviest stuff sliding south of the Panhandle and then some more coming into Kodiak Island. Jet stream showing that Arctic jet dipping down a little bit to uh, do the upper level low over the Arctic there, pushing southward tomorrow. And then the Pacific Jet, uh, well south of forecast area, except uh, coming up toward Dixon entrance there, about 120 knots out of the southwest. 9,000 feet show 35 knots southerlies there in advance of a low off the southern southeast coast. Another low with some windy ur conditions, but nothing too strong south of the Alaska Peninsula and a real weak one over the Aleutians. And then that polar vortex up there north of the Arctic coast uh, looking pretty significant there as it slowly sags southward. 3,000 feet, same pattern. Turbulence, uh, light to isolated moderate chop along the Alaska Range, mostly in the Tana Valley, maybe the White Mountains, as well as the southern southeast coast. And after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. Floating hundreds of miles from Earth, astronauts get a unique perspective of our planet. While they might recognize landmarks, space is the only place they can see the very edge of our planet's atmosphere. From orbit, particularly looking at the horizon, did bring to mind how thin the atmosphere is. It's like an onion skin around this great big ball of the Earth. This uppermost layer of Earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere, also overlaps with the very beginning of space. It's the job of NASA's new mission, GOLD, the Global Scale Observations of the Limon Disk Instrument, to study this region, a region that isn't just for astronauts to explore, but that affects humans every day down on the ground. For one thing, this layer of the upper atmosphere helps protect us from harmful radiation and energy emanating from the sun. But in our modern society, it does so much more. It affects the smartphone that sits in your pocket and the radio waves that guide our airplanes. The ionosphere is a crucial layer of the atmosphere through which our communications and GPS signals travel. And when this region changes, it impacts those communication signals. 
Changes can occur above this region from the sun's activity, also known as space weather. Changes can also occur below from Earth's weather, such as hurricanes and wind patterns. Gold connects the dots between how space weather and Earth's weather shape the upper reaches of the atmosphere. But this region isn't easy to study. The ionosphere spans roughly 60 to 400 miles from Earth's surface, which is too high for aircraft and scientific balloons, and the lower regions are too low to easily study with satellites. What are attainable, however, are the swaths of red and green light shining out from the upper atmosphere. Formed when the sun's rays hit atmospheric molecules, this light, named airglow, comes from green and red bands of glowing gas. Some of the airglow is invisible to our eyes, shining in infrared and ultraviolet light, which can only be seen with scientific instrumentation. Taking advantage of our planet's natural glow is gold. The gold instrument, which is about the size of a mini-fridge, is hitching a ride on a commercial communication satellite, SES-14. The satellite's orbit lies 22,000 miles above Earth, where it can record images in ultraviolet light to monitor changes in airglow across the globe. These images give information on the temperature, density, and composition of particles in the upper atmosphere. Gold collects these observations faster than any mission has ever done before. It captures an image of Earth's entire disk every 30 minutes, allowing scientists to see how the upper atmosphere evolves throughout the day. Gold joins a host of missions studying the very nature of space around Earth, the Sun and planets. As NASA ventures farther and farther from home, knowing the nature of space itself is crucial for our journey to understand our solar system and beyond. There's a new class of chemical compounds impacting the Earth's ozone layer and raising concerns among some scientists. But a new NASA analysis indicates stratospheric ozone could actually be impacted more by climate change and the continued release of already banned chemicals. The Earth's ozone hole is showing signs of recovery, decades after the landmark agreement called the Montreal Protocol that banned many chemical compounds harmful to the ozone layer. So we know the Montreal Protocol was a huge success. This was signed in the late 1980s when scientists and policymakers from around the world gathered together to try to save the ozone layer. The chemicals they regulated persist in the atmosphere for many decades. They thin the ozone layer and they create a seasonal hole over Antarctica. They basically take away part of our planet's natural sunscreen and that increases the risk of skin cancer and damage to plants. Scientists have projected the ozone hole could disappear almost completely by about 2075, but several factors could delay that recovery. There are some industrial compounds that are not banned by the Montreal Protocol, but as they enter the atmosphere, they will also hurt the ozone layer. But the unregulated compounds have a short lifespan in the atmosphere, unlike the chlorofluorocarbons that were originally regulated. So they have a short-lived impact on ozone, and we don't think they'll delay recovery by more than a few years. We project that by 2050, more than half of the ozone-depleting compounds in the atmosphere will come from long-lived substances banned by the protocol. Because these compounds stay in the air for such a long time, compared to the unregulated, short-lived compounds, they will have a disproportionate and lingering impact on ozone. So any non-compliance with the protocol can have significant consequences. And the really big uncertainty in ozone layer recovery is climate change. There are many naturally produced ozone-depleting substances that are emitted by the oceans. And as the oceans continue to warm due to climate change, those emissions will increase and that will further delay ozone recovery. Scientists want to better understand how climate change will affect ozone recovery. This is a hard problem. As a scientific community, we need to work on this major issue. We now have a powerful new tool to simulate atmosphere and its interaction with land and ocean to study this issue. And that's what we're going to do. How can you see the atmosphere? The answer is blowing in the wind. 
tiny particles known as aerosols are carried by the air around the globe. This visualization uses data from NASA satellites, combined with our knowledge of physics and meteorology, to track three aerosols, dust, smoke, and sea salt. Sea salt, shown here in blue, is picked up by winds passing over the ocean. As tropical storms and hurricanes form, the salt particles are concentrated into the spiraling shape we all recognize. With their movements, we can follow the formation of Hurricane Irma and see the dust from the Sahara, shown in tan, get washed out of the storm center by the rain. Advances in computing speed allow scientists to include more details of these physical processes in their simulations of how the aerosols interact with the storm systems. The increased resolution of the computer simulation is apparent in fine details like the hurricane bands spiraling counterclockwise. Computer simulations let us see how different processes fit together and evolve as a system. By using mathematical models to represent nature, we can separate the system into component parts and better understand the underlying physics of each. Today's research improves next year's weather forecasting ability. Hurricane Ophelia was very unusual. It headed northeast, pulling in Saharan dust and smoke from wildfires in Portugal, carrying both to Ireland and the UK. This aerosol interaction was very different from other storms of the season. As computing speed continues to increase, scientists will be able to bring more scientific details into the simulations, giving us a deeper understanding of our home planet. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Looking at to today's sea ice analysis, not a lot different from yesterday, except maybe a little less ice on the north side of the uh, Seward Peninsula there, and there's not much left at that anyway. And some good uh, open water, sea ice free area north of there, north of the Bering Strait, all along the west coast there, until you get to uh, near or just uh, down the coastline from Point Lay. And for the coastal water forecast, small craft advisories with that uh, low center approaching the south coast tomorrow out of the southeast along Prince of Wales Island, central coast or south central coast, east 25 knots. North coast, uh, variable 10 to 15 knots. And uh, for Lynn Canal, southeast 15. Stevens Passage is looking at northerlies at about 15 knots. And then uh, Clarence Strait looking at small craft advisories developing and those southeast winds increased to 25 knots with seas building to about five feet. And the outlook for Tuesday, west winds 10 knots on the south coast, sea 6 feet, and southwest winds at 10 on the north coast. Lynn Canal, southerlies at 20 knots, 15 knots out of the south for Stevens Passage, northwest at 10 for Clarence Strait. Prince William Sound, east winds 10 knots of 2 foot seas, variable winds at 10 for the north Gulf Coast, and seas laid down at 4 feet, 4 foot seas also for the Barren Islands to go with a 15 knot easterly breeze there, southwest 15 for Cook Inlet and southeast 15 for Kamishak Bay. And for the Tuesday outlook, east winds 15 knots, Kamishak Bay, south winds 10 to 15 knots there for Cook Inlet with two to three foot seas, southeast 15 for the Barren Islands and the western North Gulf Coast, south 15 on the east side there around Middleton Island and light winds from the southeast for Prince Liam Sound. East winds of 15 knots for the east side of Kodiak Island tomorrow, and northeast winds for Shilakoff Strait turn east to 20 knots from Sitkanak to Castle Cape, and then north 20 from Castle Cape to Cape Sarachev. Bering Sea side of the peninsula, northeast winds at 15 knots in the forecast, and Bristol Bay looking at an east wind at about 15 with slight seas. Even lighter winds for Bristol Bay and the states, or <laughs> the seas stay lay down for Tuesday southwest at 10. North 10, two foot seas on the Bering Sea side of the peninsula, Pacific side west at 15, Kodiak Island east to southeast, 15 knots with three to six foot seas. And for the uh, western Aleutians, light northerly winds at 10 knots with five to eight foot seas. Central Aleutians, same forecast, north winds at 10 knots with three to four foot seas. And call it variable, 10 to 15 knots for the Fox Islands with seas running four feet. Outlook for Tuesday. 
East to southeast breezes at 10 to 15 knots for the Fox Islands and seas uh, 3 to maybe 6 feet. East 15 for the central Aleutians, 4 to 7 foot seas. And from Adak to Amchitka, north at 15 and Amchitka to Shimia, east at 10. North winds, 25 knots for St. Lawrence Island tomorrow, so small craft advisories there, but uh, north to northwest at 15 for the southwest coast. Light northerlies for the Pribilofs, west 15, St. Matthew Island. And moving on to Tuesday, St. Lawrence Island, northerlies at 30 knots. Northwest 15 for the Yukon Delta Coast and west at 10 for the Cusquam Delta coastline. St. Matthew Island, northerlies at 20 knots, 7 foot seas, northwest 15 for the Pribilofs. Eastern Boulevard Sea Coast, northwest winds 15 to 20 knots, west 15 for the Central Coast, west side, northwest 20. And then increasing northerly winds, we've got uh, small craft advisories from Cape Bullfort southward to Wales with uh, winds as high as 30 knots. And then for Tuesday, less winds, still pretty brisk, though, small craft advisories. Wales up to Cape Thompson, north 30 knots, 20 knot winds up to Cape Bullfort. Then lighter winds along the Arctic coast, just uh, west-northwest at 10, central on the east side, maybe 15 knots on the west side. And for tonight, that uh, front coming down from the Arctic there, getting pushed southward by a upper level low coming down that's farther north over the Arctic there. They'll push a chance of light rain, fog, and drizzle along the western central Arctic coast tonight. Dry over the northern interior, but stays wet along that trough axis, central and to a certain extent southern interior, unsettled for the north Gulf Coast. Rain moves back into the southern panhandle and a chance of rain along the Alaska Peninsula. As you can see, that front stays south of the Aleutians out there on Monday with no change in the Bering Sea. Arctic front pushing so southward. Uh, there's cooler air behind that, and the best chance of moisture looks like it'll be over the northeast interior out to the Arctic coast. Otherwise, rain for the Panhandle, especially central and southern areas with the small craft advisory winds on the south coast. Lighter winds the next day there, and storminess pushes southward along the west coast with a weak low developing west of Nunavak Island. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.